Hello, everyone. Um, I would like to welcome you to Sussex Development Lectures. Um, and I'd really want to thank you, first of all, for joining us, whether you're watching live on Zoom, whether you're on YouTube, or, you know, maybe you're tuning in after the event itself. All the same, welcome. And thank you for joining us. My name is Farai Jena, and I'm a senior lecturer in economics here at the University of Sussex in Brighton, and I'll be chairing this event. Um, I'd like to welcome Marco Nardi, who is providing interpretation for us from English to British Sign Language. If you're on Twitter, the hashtags for the event are hashtag SussexDev and hashtag GlobalDevTrends. So this is the fifth lecture of the Sussex Development Lecture Series. Um, and the series is an opportunity to hear from leading global thinkers on development. It's run jointly by the Institute of Development Studies, the School of Global Studies, the Science Policy and Research Unit, and the Center for International Education based here at the University of Sussex. The current series is called uh, COVID-19 and Development, building back better, question mark. And the series is motivated by the global impact of COVID-19 on economies and societies, including issues concerning inequality, injustice, accountability, state and social relations, and what have you. Today's lecture is titled COVID-19 and Development, Debt Dynamics and Sustainability. And we've got two speak speakers, Dr. Andreas Antoniadis, who is a senior lecturer in international relations here at the University of Sussex, who will be in conversation with Dr. Baba Yusuf Musa, who is director, director general, West African Institute for Financial and Economic Management. Um, Andreas is an expert in political science, international relations and international development. He has research expertise in a variety of topics, including interactions between the sustainable development goals, national debt and social and uh, political factors. And he has published widely in various academic journals. Baba has a wealth of experience in public debt management on the policy and practitioner front, including working with an array of international financial institutions and government departments, um, including working for the Central Bank of Nigeria, He's an expert in public domestic debt management and subnational government debt. So Andreas and Baba will discuss what is happening on the ground when it comes to debt dynamics and sustainability, how the current debt conundrum relates to broader sustainability transition dynamics, and offer some prop propositions on um, where we go from here. So just a few housekeeping rules before we begin. Please keep yourself muted if you're on Zoom. Questions and comments are most welcome from the audience. Feel free to type in questions in the chat box in Zoom or comments box on YouTube and the selection of these questions um, will be addressed in the Q&A session. Um, the lecture will run for about an hour, so we go until 6 p.m. GMT. Um, now, without further ado, I'll hand over to Andreas first. Great, thank you very much, uh, Farai, for your kind introduction. Uh, let me share my screen. So let me let me start by thanking from my side too. You know the the organizer, our audience today, uh, you, Farai, and Marco, and of, uh, and of course Baba Musa for accepting our invitation to join us for this Sussex Development Lecture. In my brief introduction, what I will try to do is to offer a broader perspective on uh, global debt dynamics, and then Baba uh, will come step in and offer a more detailed analysis of the impact of these dynamics and using also examples from uh, West Africa. So in my presentation, I will mostly make uh, four points in 15 minutes. If I fail to make four, I will make three points. The first, I will start with a, with a paradox, okay? a paradox on uh, global data dynamics in the context of SDGs. Then uh, I will discuss uh, why these data dynamics are socially unsustainable, especially in low-income countries. And finally, if I have time, I will close with a brief note on where we can, where we should go from here. 
so let me start with a paradox. Uh, it is now common ground that global debt has reached historically unprecedented uh, levels uh, in the global economy. Okay, uh, IMF has estimates that at uh, 320 percent of global GDP. But where I'm coming from, the most important problem is not the absolute size of debt itself, but the fact that for, most, for, for more than a decade, uh, debt has been increasing substantially in all sectors of the, of the economy, of the global economy, household, corporations, states, and in all corners of the global economy, okay? in, all regions, uh, in all regions of the world. And this increase was happening at the same time when global growth rates were coming down. Okay? In advanced economies, we were discussing the great stagnation, secular stagnation in, in China, uh, the rebalancing of its economy, and so on. So uh, I, will, uh, I will show some slides only for aesthetic reasons, to be very honest. You see here this substantial increase, the blue line of global total debt both public and private. You see here the increase in government debt in emerging economies, the substantial increase of debt more than four times from 2008 to 2020 in the private sector of emerging economies. But the main problem is also here, if you will. This is the global picture. GDP, the red line, is coming down. Debt is going up. And the same trend is even more pronounced in emerging markets and developing economies. Okay, an abrupt fall in GDP and an abrupt increase in debt. Okay, more debt, less uh, growth. This is clearly unsustainable. Where is the paradox? The paradox is in the global strategy for dealing with sus uh, for dealing, excuse me, with sustainable development goals. Okay, the global strategy for dealing for meeting uh, uh, sustainable development goals is based on a generation of enormous new, new debt generating flows, enormous new debt stocks, if you will. We estimate this between one and two trillion per year from the private sector only for the period 2015-2030, okay, for the, sustainable, for the SDGs. And of course, this, this investment, this, this debt generating flows in, include investments in critical uh, areas like health, food, education, uh, climate change, biodiversity. So this is the paradox, okay? Uh, we live in a world that accumulates, is a float of debt, and at the same time, we are employing debt as the main strategy of transition outside of the, uh, of the crisis, transition to the future, if you will. My second point. My second point is that despite a great variation on the ground between different countries, and Baba will say more about the variation on the ground, it is important, the current degree of financial distress experienced by developing economies, many emerging uh, markets, especially though in low-income countries, is socially unsustainable. And it is socially unsustainable regardless of debt sustainability analysis, regardless, regardless of the sustainability of, the, of debt dynamics in this country. The situation was already very precarious before the pandemic, okay? The pandemic was uh, exacerbated an already very bad uh, situation. And I would like to point to three very important socioeconomic dynamics in this regard that were uh, deteriorating before the pan pandemic. The first uh, is, of course, increased debt distress. It is well known that more than 40% of low-income countries were in debt distress or in high risk of debt distress before the pandemic. Okay? And this only gets worse now with the pandemic. I am happy to come back in any specific point on this. The second is extreme poverty. Okay, extreme poverty, the pace of poverty reduction was, uh, had slowed down significantly here before the crisis. And in 2020, it is the first year in almost 20 years, the first time in almost 20 years, that we see a major increase in the absolute number of extreme poor in, uh, in, in the global economy. Okay, it is estimated by the World Bank, and uh, although I think this is a very 
very optimistic uh, uh, estimation, 120 million people. But uh, equally important is that the nature of the problem of extreme debt, uh, of extreme, excuse me, poverty changes. Okay. Uh, before the crisis, extreme debt dynamics were concentrated in sub-Saharan Africa. With the pandemic, the problem of extreme debt returns back to populous uh, countries in South, uh, South Asia, like India, Bangladesh, that, ha uh, that have massive population, very large populations on the verge of poverty. These are uh, different scenarios on, uh, on the impact of COVID-19 on extreme, uh, on new poor in uh, 2020. And this, this dark yellow lines, this is the baseline scenario for the World Bank. This, this dark yellow are increases in extreme poor in South Asia, okay? 72 million for the 1.90, uh, 155 million for the 3.2 threshold. So uh, a, a massive, massive uh, regression in terms of extreme poverty. And, and of course, equally important, from 2015, uh, hunger, poor insecurity, uh, food insecurity, excuse me, has been increases, increasing since 2015, okay? From 2015 to 2018, we have more than 120 million more uh, uh, people uh, facing uh, uh, extreme food in insecurity. And all these adverse, adverse dynamics, okay, are taking place in a period where debt was going up and debt service has significantly increased, especially for low income countries. Here is a, a list of developed countries, debt service on external debt, okay, you see a significant increase from 2010 to 2016, and then a massive increase again uh, from 2016 to the present day. So my argument is that developing countries, especially low-income countries, in the current conditions cannot maintain the existing level of social and basic need provisions that they have. Okay, they cannot really do it, let alone uh, improving it as it was aspired in the UN Agenda 2030. My third point is even gloomier, I'm, I'm afraid. Okay. Uh, this situation, this adverse dynamics will become a lot worse in the years to come and nothing in the current global debt architecture seems able or has the capacity to reverse, to arrest this new domino of socioeconomic crisis that is building up. Three points I would like very briefly to, to, to make here. Uh, let me see how I'm doing with time. Three points I, I would like to make. The first is that we know from research, recent research that epidemics and pandemics, uh, the, full, uh, the full impact of epidemics and pandemics, the full negative impact, adverse impact of pandemics, takes five years to reach its maximum, okay? It takes five years to reach its uh, negative peak, if, if you will. And uh, this comes in a vicious cycle. Okay. Uh, in a vicious cycle where uh, slower pandemics lead to slower economic growth, slower economic growth uh, increases uh, instability, increasing stability leads to increased social unrest, and of course, uh, uh, increased social unrest is, is, has a negative impact on, on, on growth. Okay, so a new vicious cycle on, uh, on development, if you will. This does not look promising, but uh, other factors, other uh, dynamics will, uh, will happen in the same time that will exacerbate, exacerbate this negative impact. The fact is that, you know, if you factor in that in the next, allow me the prediction that in the next two to four years, advanced economies uh, will be attempting, at least attempting to move towards mon monetary normalization, toward, towards increasing their interest rates, okay? If, if you think of this, if you digest the, what this means, it means that it, it, uh, at what looks like, if you will, what looks like uh, light in the end 
of the tunnel for advanced economies, for developed countries, looks like a new minefield for, uh, for uh, developing uh, economies, especially low-income countries, okay? Especially in terms of uh, debt, uh, debt servicing. Uh, they will be hit hard by an increase in servicing, in the cost of servicing their debt at the moment that the impact of the pandemic will be at its maximum and at the moment when the uh, debt service suspension initiatives that are running will be off, essentially. Now, in all this, critical dimension is the response to the crisis. What will be our response to the current dynamics? Okay, all loose and less loose ends of the current global debt architecture are based on the IMF World Bank uh, Debt Sustainability Framework and in, on the debt sustainability analysis produced by the IMF. Okay, uh, now, uh, there is no easy way of, of seeing this, but the, the, the aim of debt sustainability analysis is to make debt sustainable, okay? Debt sustainability analysis are part of broader economic adjustment programs that have as their as main aim fiscal discipline, okay? uh, despite or even especially if the economic adjustment programs are associated with debt relief. Now, my point here is that if you try to see, or if we try to read, understand, and tackle the current adverse debt dynamics through the narrow eyes of DSF, the Debt Sustainability Framework, then what we will be doing will be to postpone but exacerbate the social and environmental uh, crisis aspects, uh, uh, adverse uh, dynamics that lay lie ahead of us. If I have, uh, I have two minutes. I don't have the four, for my four point. Okay, uh, I, very briefly. Well, two things: the, the years ahead will be difficult, but the years ahead are the critical years for the aspired transition to sustainability. So they will determ determine our transition to sustainability. Uh, I will just make two points here. The first is that we need to, of course, to change the existing global debt architecture. And I think an important step, an urgent step that we usually postpone because it takes time is to organize you know, a new global convention, a new global summit that will renegotiate the Articles of Agreements, that is the constitution of the IMF, as this was created in, uh, in 1974 in Bretton Woods. Okay? Uh, the, Bre the, the IMF, if it is to remain relevant in the response, and if it is to remain relevant in global debt architecture, it needs to have more uh, leeway, uh, independence agency in, uh, in determining global liquidity, and most importantly, it needs to be able to create uh, reserve assets. It needs to be able to create uh, SDRs, that is money, uh, without this creation to be pre-allocated to its member states according to their quotas. And, and the second point is, uh, I'm going back again to the debt sustainability framework, just, uh, just to say that uh, this will determine the success, you know, whether we will all fail together or not. If we try to restore debt sustainability through, uh, DS, uh, through the DSF, then what we will end up is creating a new crisis. Rather, what uh, we need to do is the IMF taking the initiative and transforming its own economic adjustment programs uh, to uh, environmental sustainability programs, environmental transition programs, the programs that will help the global economy transition to a sustainable future. Thank you very much. I will leave it here. Thank you very much, Andreas, for that um, very interesting talk, which gives us a lot to reflect on and think about and opens up a lot of discussion. I'm just going to hand over to Baba for an immediate response from him um, and also for him to give his presentation. Thank you. Uh, 
Uh, thank you very much, uh, Farai. I I am also going to share my my screen and uh, um, just outrightly uh, say that I, I fully support uh, what Andre's uh, uh, position is in 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 in, in his uh, conclusion. Now, in my presentation, I, I what I plan to do is uh, to to just talk on a quick uh, few slides um, to re-echo some of the issues that um, um, Andre uh, earlier pointed out, and then later also uh, give some views, uh, especially uh, the, the developing countries' uh, perspective to show really what the developing countries are going through. Um, the experience I have uh, mostly uh, from the, the African countries. So I'm going to share the, the African context and of course, uh, low, low, low income countries. So by way of uh, just outline, I, I want to just briefly uh, you know, discuss uh, the, the, the condition that African countries uh, have been in prior to the, the, the COVID in terms of uh, debt dynamics. And, and then later uh, talk about the, the uh, impact of the COVID-19 on, on, the, on the economies of uh, the, the African countries of Saharan Africa in particular, as well as uh, low income countries. And then describe the channels where the, uh, the impact uh, passed through and uh, responses that um, countries have given to address the issues of uh, Date on sustainability, and uh, of course, uh, conclude with some uh, with some some few few, few uh, thoughts. Now, by uh, j j j just to put context ticks into context, um, just as the researchers said that um, COVID uh, pandemic usually manifests itself uh, more, or the impact of COVID nineteen uh, affects uh, the vulnerable uh, human being uh, more than the a human being that uh, has a normal uh, condition. Uh, in a similar way, uh, you know, the, the, the pandemic affected the uh, countries uh, that uh, have had uh, some economic uh, underlying conditions before uh, the, the pandemic. So at the end, uh, the, the pandemic uh, actually hit them hard. And now when you want to look at the sub-Saharan African economies, and uh, indeed the low-income countries, I have classified the impact in, in four different ways. Uh, one being economic, uh, another one being social, and of course the health, and then I classify others as uh, others, including the political uh, issues. So generally, when uh, you look at the sub-Saharan African countries and uh, developing countries, uh, just prior to the pandemic, there are six critical factors that uh, were the underlying conditions. Uh, one was uh, weak economic uh, performance. Um, from 2015, to uh, 2019, if you look at the uh, economic growth of uh, most of Saharan African countries, particularly the bigger ones, uh, Nigeria and South Africa, uh, the economies tend to uh, have a weak, weak growth. But uh, generally, in addition to the Nigerian and the South African economy, uh, most other African economies experience growth that are within the range of uh, 3%, which cannot be said to be um, uh, high performance. And then at that time also prior to COVID-19, uh, most sub-Saharan African countries had very uh, limited uh, fiscal space. And then of course, uh, as Andre, uh, Andres uh, presented in his uh, presentation, um, uh, there were a lot of um, rising debt. Uh, as a matter of fact, about 44% of uh, the countries that are eligible for the IMF, RTG, uh, uh, facilities um, were already either at high risk of debt distress or already in debt distress. And then the economies of uh, the um, sub-Saharan Africa are always susceptible to uh, external and domestic shocks. So there were structural factors such as uh, undiversified export base and heavy reliance on foreign inputs uh, for their industries, um, uh, as well as uh, other socioeconomic problems such as uh, huge unemployment and infrastructure deficit. So these were the conditions that uh, the African, Sub-Saharan African economies found themselves uh, at the end of 2019, just prior to the uh, uh, pandemic. And uh, this graph just uh, briefly, this shows the growth rate of uh, the uh, Sub-Saharan Africa. If you look at the one by the chart two, which is the one to the right, you see that from 2015, there has been a downward trend 
uh, in the in the in the in the in the growth rate of uh, sub-Saharan Africa. So the message I'm trying to give here uh, is that um, there was a uh, the low most most of the low income African countries and other developing countries had a weak and unsustainable uh, economic growth, which really affects the debt dyna dynamics. Now, as I mentioned earlier, they had very limited uh, fiscal space. Um, this graph also shows the condition uh, of uh, net borrowing, otherwise called uh, overall balance as a percentage of GDP in uh, 2020, uh, at the end of 2020 and uh, at the beginning of, uh, I mean, sorry, at the end of 2019 and then uh, December 2020. And you could see clearly that just within one year, there were um, huge shocks in, the, in terms of uh, uh, overall balance. And the graph to the left shows with the condition where Sub-Saharan Africa is as at, uh, or was as at 2019, and to the right, uh, it described the position uh, after uh, 2019. And of course, um, you when you look at the table, you will realize that the Sub-Saharan African growth average about three to 4%. While if you look at the uh, low-income countries in general, uh, on the average between 2015 and 2019, the growth rate hovers around uh, 2.5 to 3 percent. Now, in terms of debt sustainability, as I mentioned, about 44 percent uh, of the low-income countries were either at the risk of debt distress or were already uh, in, in debt distress. As a matter of fact, by the end of 2019, 16 countries that were eligible for the uh, IMF uh, uh, PRGT were already in debt distress, and about 28 were at the high, high risk of uh, debt distress. If you look at uh, the Anglophone West Africa, where I am working, as, as at the end of 2017, uh, the five Anglophone West African countries, of all of them, one was, uh, only one was at the low risk of uh, debt distress. But by the end of 2019, uh, one was at uh, already in debt distress, two were already uh, at high risk of debt distress, or three, and then only one at a medium uh, classified, was classified as a, a, a country of medium risk, risk of uh, debt distress. So the key message is that um, the had uh, countries in Sub-Saharan Africa had an elevated uh, uh, debt burden already in 2019. And then of course, they had a very weak external uh, position, and then there were also economic vulnerabilities. Now, in addition to that, uh, there were also weak production structure, health issues, and other uh, uh, social factors such as uh, increasing poverty, governance issue, security challenges, all of which has to do <coughs> bearing uh, with debt sustainability. Now, what are the impacts of the, um, the COVID-19? Now, in the COVID-19, when you look at the economies of uh, the Sub-Saharan Africa, uh, there are negative impacts and positive impacts. Now, the negative impacts, uh, were usually uh, what we noticed was uh, the ones that had the immediate impact were the transportation, airline, uh, industries, as well as uh, the, the train, hospitality to, and tourism, trade, informal sector, consumer discretion, face-to-face -face education, health, um, suffered a lot where uh, other health-related matters that relate to Africa, such as malaria, uh, tuberculosis, and others, suffered uh, significantly because attention was diverted now to, to COVID. And then there was, of course, a lot of layoffs where we had an increase um, unemployment. And then in, when you look at it in household, uh, there were complete uh, a reduction in purchasing power of uh, general household in sub-Saharan Africa. Uh, reduction in real income, standard of living, and then of course changing in consumption pattern. Um, there were some that had protracted uh, impact. Uh, this relates to financial institutions and the financial market. The oil and gas suffered significantly. Uh, construction and the airline industries also suffered. But um, apart from the negative impact, very few uh, sectors had a positive impact particularly the online and entertainment uh, industry, the pharmaceutical, e-commerce, and remittances. Uh, we have noticed uh, some increased flow. So generally, when you look at uh, the sub-Saharan African countries uh, in the context of COVID-19, the experience that we had was a decline in foreign direct investment, 
showing very much increase in short term borrowing, huge credit exposure, especially to uh, oil and gas industries. Um, then uh, creation of, uh, of course, heavy burden on infrastructure, especially the, uh, the internet, of course, restricted uh, access to global liquidity. But despite that, we also uh, experience very high cyber uh, issues, uh, operational constraints, um, foreign exchange uh, flows, uh, disruption, and then fiscal and uh, debt sustainability uh, challenges uh, to mention a uh, few. Now, when you look at uh, the projections that the IMF and, uh, and the World Bank look, uh, especially through the um, uh, World Economic Outlook, uh, the, the outlook between uh, the post I mean, the post COVID between 2020 uh, going forward does not appear to look uh, uh, good, which uh, brings some concern, of course, major concern about the debt sustainability issues. If you look at the Sub Saharan Africa, for instance, uh, the fiscal balance uh, the, by the projections of the World Economic Outlook of the IMF, it will continue to have uh, a very serious uh, fiscal issues. And then, of course, uh, the Sub Saharan Africa will continue to have a uh, current account problem uh, going forward. And if you look at it in, uh, in, in details, in a much uh, detailed way, uh, when you want to compare the Asia, Latin America, and Sub Saharan African countries, uh, they, they, there is going to be a substantial increase in uh, uh, government debt. Uh, as uh, we are uh, at the moment, when you look at uh, the position where the, the Sub-Saharan Africa was uh, as at uh, the end of 2019, the government debt percentage of government debt to, to GDP was about uh, a little bit above 40 uh, percent, but it is projected to uh, rise to about 46 or 47 percent. Uh, by 2021, and the trend seems to show uh, a continuous uh, uh, trend. And if you want, if you also look at the uh, the sovereign rating for the Sub-Saharan Africa in terms of co commercial borrowing, uh, the average rating uh, rating for the Sub-Saharan African countries uh, reached its lowest level uh, during the the pandemic. Um, if you look at the uh, the, the average rating. Uh, most sub-Saharan African countries are below the B plus uh, rating. And no wonder since uh, March 2020, there has not been any issuance by sub-Saharan Africa a country. And uh, that means that uh, most of those countries are facing increasing high cost of, uh, of, of financing. Now, when you look at the, uh, the interventions that uh, the international community provided, so far, it appears not to uh, be uh, enough to, to meet the, um, the, the needs of the sub-Saharan African countries. Uh, there has been substantial support from the IMF and the World Bank and the regional uh, development institutions like the African Development Bank. But uh, so far, the experience is that uh, the, 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 the intervention is still not enough. Uh, the desuspension initiative that uh, the G20 provided uh, was also not adequate at all. Uh, as a matter of fact, by the end of uh, 2020, um, out of the 12 billion that uh, they have uh, promised to uh, generate, I think only about 4 uh, billion um, uh, was able to, 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 to come to fruition, which means that uh, there is still a lot more uh, to, to be done. Um, the, as I mentioned earlier, the World Bank and the IMF uh, did try to disburse some, some funding to uh, the low income countries. But what those funding did was actually increasing the debt. It gave them some leverage in terms of meeting the liquidity, finding some liquidity to attend to immediate needs, but it also added to the uh, debt situation where uh, the countries found themselves uh, uh, in uh, the end of uh, 2029, uh, by the end of 2029. Um, I want to just focus a little more about uh, the intervention that uh, the Anglophone uh, West Africa provided. Um, generally, because of the uh, pandemic, uh, there were some physical pressures that were exerted on the finances of, of government. And therefore, governments were forced to uh, provide some stimulus uh, packages to uh, provide uh, some liquidity. And if you look at the, the chart that I'm, I'm projecting, 
Uh, there were some stimulus package plans that were provided, and uh, those stimulus uh, packages had to come from some funding through the diversion of some resources uh, by the fiscal authorities and the monetary authorities. And uh, if you look at the Anglophone countries, uh, all the five uh, Anglophone speaker countries uh, have embarked on all those things. Then there were additional spending and uh, some foregone revenue that all the countries had to also suffer from. And then, of course, uh, the finding liquidity through the G20 uh, initiatives. But in addition to that, there were some guarantees that some of the countries had to uh, provide. And uh, Ghana and Nigeria in particular uh, suffered from uh, those uh, guarantees. In addition to that, there were some policy uh, intervention like um, putting down policy rates, uh, foreign exchange intervention, direct lending to small scale industries, lowering of uh, loan provisions, easing of capital conservation buffers, lowering of uh, reserve requirement of commercial banks to enable them have some liquidities, purchase of government bonds, creating of uh, a, cre a credit easing, uh, and then of course, uh, accessing the World Bank IMF and uh, African Development Bank uh, support. Now, looking at the debt dynamics, uh, this is where this uh, table really shows where the, the concern is. Uh, in terms of uh, debt dynamics in, in Africa. Now, when you look at the position uh, by the left, the, the chart by the left that had the December 2019, this was the position where uh, of the debt dynamics of Anglophone West Africa. Uh, the debt dynamics relates to the macro, the debt financing, and the, the, the debt profile indicators. As at the end of 2019, um, the, the GDP, uh, when you look at uh, the real GDP, uh, the inflation and interest rate, exchange rate, public sector revenue, public sector expenditure, as well as current account policies. The situation was um, just 50-50, uh, if I may put it this way. Uh, there were some few countries that, had, uh, that were classified as having some strong indicators in terms of GDP, uh, inflation, interest rate, and exchange rate. Um, and some uh, more had uh, also medium outlook in terms of uh, uh, real GDP growth, um, inflation, interest rate, and exchange rate. Uh, when you look at the debt financing uh, indicators, especially external and domestic debt, the situation was uh, already tilting towards the weak uh, position. And the debt profile was at the medium, in terms I mean, debt, debt indicators were at, 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 was at a medium outlook. But uh, going forward, just a year after, in December, you could see that every indicator relating to the macro. And as you know, it is the macro that determines the date. Uh, already, all the macro projections are already in the weak position. So when you look at the real GDP growth, it's in the weak. Uh, inflation is already weak. Uh, interest rate is weak. Uh, exchange rate weak. Public sector revenue weak. Uh, current account balances also looking weak. So in general, the, the outlook for uh, the debt sustainability, looking at the macro uh, physical projections, uh, appears to be unsustainable. And therefore, going forward, it is difficult to now project the debt sustainability situation of uh, the uh, countries. And I'm, I believe that this projection truly reflects the position of uh, Sub-Saharan Africa and uh, many other low-income countries beyond Africa. Now. What, uh, what is the way forward? Uh, will history its, uh, repeat itself? Uh, in other words, uh, what, what is the outlook for, for future? Now, from the experience that we had, uh, especially prior to the HIPIC initiative, uh, what, found, what we found or what history shows is that higher government and private debt and the riskier composition of debt was associated with the uh, probability of debt crisis. And also, history has also uh, told us that when we borrow funds and we are diverted toward purposes for which they are not uh, uh, for, for not productive purposes, uh, it also slowed growth as well as uh, create uh, debt sustainability issues. Um, between twenty uh, between nineteen ninety and twenty twenty, um, when you look at the uncertainty index, um, the coronavirus appears to bring the highest set of uh, uncertainty. Now, coupled with this uncertainty, when you look at the, the, the dead dynamics uh, in terms of history, 
um, it is most likely that we are going to enter another uh, debt crisis uh, that we were uh, just before the the hippie. Now, what is the um, what? Are the, in summary, what, what are we trying to say? We, what, what what we said is that countries have experienced increasing fiscal pressures uh, with elevated uh, debt vulnerabilities. Um, and therefore, there is need to mobilize additional poverty resources to help uh, the poor and the vulnerable community uh, in the sub-Saharan Africa. But the issue is that uh, there is a confidence uh, issue because of the uncertainty. And therefore, uh, these countries will really require additional funding. Now, to get additional funding in a precarious uh, debt situation, uh, when you want to borrow, it means that you will borrow to add to uh, uh, the debt, and therefore the issue of debt sustainability uh, will be of a big uh, question. The G20 initiative, the China initiative, we said, have not uh, been uh, helpful enough uh, because they only suspended uh, their service for some few years, uh, but they are not, uh, uh, the, the, the evil day will still be uh, there. And in other words, you still have to pay the debt service. And with increasing uh, accumulation of debt, especially the short-term debt, uh, definitely the countries will not be able to pay for uh, the their service. Now there's a backlash uh, of trade and monetary problems, especially the ones that uh, relates to Europe uh, and China, which had a lot of uh, strain again on the economies of uh, the West Africa, I mean the Sub-Saharan Africa. Central banks have been trying to push more money into uh, the economies. Unfortunately, the stimulus packages are still not yet enough. And uh, we have not seen the end of uh, Corona, and therefore there will still be need for more uh, funding. Up to now, supply chains have been disrupted, and uh, this is also adding to strain the economies of uh, the sub-Saharan Africa. And despite uh, the increase in debt, the need to reduce, uh, reduce fiscal pressure uh, is uh, on the on the government. And so some countries have been able uh, to seek for for relief. Uh, but this relief, as I mentioned, is just a one-year relief, but they will still um, have to pay. Um, again, uh, one other precarious situation is that a lot of the countries have uh, borrowed from the uh, commercial creditors. And uh, with the commercial lending, they were unable to seek for debt relief because uh, the, the collective action clause um, has not been triggered, and uh, some of the borrowings that they have done prior to 2019 have no uh, collective action clause, and therefore they are forced to 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 pay. So, what is the final situation? Um, our proposal. Well, our proposal is that uh, we should develop model of process going forward that will create a, a, a provision for uh, debt uh, rescheduling in both the commercial and uh, multilateral debt. And uh, of course, enhance policies to promote uh, non debt create uh, financing. And then, of course, uh, we need some robust financial sector regulation and supervision to help the economies. We need to issue some contingency bonds from the state to enable state have some funding. Uh, above all, sound debt management is the most important uh, uh, issue going forward. So, as, as a final uh, remark, countries uh, need some relief to be able to, to pay uh, their debt service going forward. Some countries will still require deeper debt restructuring. Countries will still need to uh, you know, build their domestic uh, market uh, in order to have some liquidity. And then countries will create alternative and innovative ways of, uh, of financing. I thank you very much for your attention. Uh, thank you very much, Baba, for again that you know comprehensive presentation that offers interesting perspectives and showcases some of the experiences on the ground um, in the context of Sub-Saharan Africa as well as Anglo West African countries, um, and also for those recommendations that you propose towards the end. Um, so I think it's been really really insightful. I think in the interest of time, what I'll do is I'll turn to the audience because we have a few questions that have come in whilst um, Andreas and yourself, Baba, have been presenting. So I'm just going to look through and uh, pose some of this, these questions. Either of you or both of you are welcome to respond depending on the question, obviously. So the first question is on um, 
on China, um, Noah Williams um, asks, how can China's participation in the G20's DSSI framework help debt sustainability in Africa? Um, and I think, I mean, I would add also just to, to that question out of personal interest, because we, we all know China is one of the largest, newest uh, creditors to, em to emerging market countries. And I think there are also new participants such as India, um, as well as private lenders in increasingly um, lending. So, you know, the, the, the question is what, what in, in this case, for the case of China in particular, um, how, how does their participation in the G20s framework um, help with that su sustainability issues on the continent? So I don't know if Baba, you want to go first? Okay. I, yes, I can go first and Andres can, Andres can support me. Um, with, with, with China, uh, you, you know, as I mentioned in my, my presentation, um, the, their participation in the G20 initiative was only uh, uh, for, for, for a temporary suspension of, of, of debt uh, just for about a year. And uh, going by the example of um, our experience of countries that suffered from Ebola crisis in, in, in our region, uh, particularly uh, Sierra Leone, uh, the, the Gambia, and uh, Guinea, uh, as well as Liberia, this country took, took, these countries took about five years to fully recover from the shocks uh, that, uh, that, that came from the pandemic, uh, e e Ebola crisis. Now, when you want to uh, look at those kind of experience, the Ebola crisis did not hit the economies as hard as the coronavirus. Now, the coronavirus uh, now hit those economies much more than the uh, Ebola pandemic. So to give a day suspension of one year uh, is just uh, scratching uh, the surface they really have not addressed the issue. The main issue is that these countries will require relief beyond, I mean, uh, so, so suspension of debt service beyond minimum of five years as presented by, 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 by Andres. And uh, uh, for, for, for me, uh, from the experience that we have seen, uh, even if you give them the five years uh, suspension, as long as they will pay for the debt service, uh, it is going to take them, it still will hit the economy uh, much harder. Because the, as I projected, when you look at the macro indicators, they are all looking very weak. They are, and that has been the projection over the next five years. So to just uh, give a one year moratorium, you are just scratching the, the, the surface. So what we'll, we recommend is that um, uh, the, the, these countries require relief uh, they, to, to, to enable them, you know, get into a, a good macro position and then start experiencing economic growth that will enable them uh, build on their on their economies. And a final note on on the on the Chinese loan is that uh, I think going forward, uh, commercial lending and uh, including Chinese borrowing must have a provision for uh, debt, debt restructuring arrangement. So that uh, when countries are hit with uh, exogenous shocks like this, uh, those uh, you know restructuring arrangement can be called upon. Thank you, Andrea. Do you want to um, respond? I will just uh, thirty seconds to say that I very much agree with what uh, Baba just uh, said. The problem is with the DSSI initiative, and that it is not capable to deliver what we need. I think it, it was very good that the Chinese have joined the initiative. It was very good that uh, beyond the state, you know, because there are many sources of uh, debt from China to Africa, that they, it, major uh, banks in China have joined the DSSI initiative. These are very important, I think, uh, developments. And the other thing is that, you, you know, uh, China holds uh, the largest part of debt in only a minority of countries in in Africa, okay. I think uh, Angola, Cameroon, I think Kenya, if I'm not wrong. So uh, it, China cannot uh, change the situation on its own. It's, it's an important player, but it's one of the players. 
Thank you. Oh, thank you. Yes. Um, so on to you, Andreas. Um, this question is about the parad paradox that you spoke about earlier in your presentation. So Emmanuel is asking, how do we resolve the paradox raised uh, by Andreas, bearing in mind the need for enough financial resources by these developing countries for containment and recovery of economies? in the face of dwindling domestic revenue capabilities, uh, capacities due to weak economic growth? Let's, let's organize another event to, to answer the question for Emmanuel. Emmanuel, I think, I think that this, is, this is a great, great, great question, okay? Uh, I don't see, uh, there are multiple crises that are happening at the same time. One is the economic crisis, and I think Abad did an excellent job to, 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 to demonstrate, you know, uh, how much in the corner are uh, uh, especially low-income African economies. Uh, uh, but what we really need to do is to try to solve the problem in a way, in, in, in a way that addresses also the environmental constraints uh, that we are currently facing. Uh, what, what I see as the major solution, as I was trying to say very briefly in my uh, response, is the emergence of a new debt architecture that will be able to create new money, if you will, in SD, preferably in SDRs. I mean, ideally, ideally, this would be, you know, you, uh, uh, digital money created by the United Nations. We are not there yet. I think well, the closest that we are to something like that is the special drawing rights, the money created, reserve assets created by the IMF. This increases the pie without requiring a major redistribution, if you will, in the global economy. And of course, along with this, we need whatever assistance is there in terms of credit line, in terms of debt relief and so on, to, to, to be enhanced. Uh, in, in, in some regards, you can think of this as uh, a, a, an institution that creates a massive new pool of money or as a HIC 2.0, uh, okay, the heavily indebted poverty uh, 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 poor countries, okay, uh, we need to deal effectively with the uh, with uh, with uh, the debt crisis. Sorry, I'm running. Uh, we're running out of time, so I will stop here. Sorry. Mm -hmm. um, so, so I'm just trying to see. There, there are still a bit, a few more questions, but maybe I'll just pose um, one last question in the because we, we are running out of time. Um, so this is Lily who says, "Hi everyone, greetings from Trinity College, Dublin." Thank you for the great panel. My question is how the panelists today expect the work of the COVID vaccine production, purchase and distribution, how do they expect, expect that to likely affect the SNL outlook in Africa? Uh, particularly considering the fact that countries like South Africa, for example, are paying double for the Oxford vaccine compared to European buyers. So e either one of you, very briefly, literally, at, we've got two minutes. Well, I go ahead? Okay, go ahead. Um, I think uh, for I, the issue is uh, we is with the non debt creating flows. Uh, we are already in uh, a precarious position. Um, anything that uh, could be that we the economies can do or can get that is non debt creating is what is welcome. Unfortunately, um, uh, we are in a worker position. We already have uh, external vulnerabilities. Our reserve positions are already low. And then we still need to buy the vaccines to, at a higher cost to, uh, to, 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 to vaccinate uh, our citizens. So we, we are still you know, being faced with hostile um, external environment. And uh, countries really will require some kind of relief uh, to enable them uh, get some funding uh, that will buy th these um, vaccines to to uh, you know assist the, the citizens. I, I see it as a um, some kind of a human rights issue. Mm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Brilliant. Perhaps well, perhaps just <laughs> what I mean. There there are some interesting questions. There is one on on the current um, low interest rates. Um, globally, really, what will be the effect of extended low interest rates in the developed 
in, in the developed countries on both developed and e emerging economies. Um, after 2008, we find that rates had been kept low almost permanently. Um, you know, for, 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 can, can I suggest something? I see, see great questions by, you know, uh, David Jenner and Usman. So I don't think that we have the time and it would be great to, to, to hear your concluding thoughts as well. So if, if uh, uh, I would be very happy to respond to the, to, you know, to the questions individually after the seminar, but uh, it would be great to close now with your thoughts. Okay, brilliant. Thank you, Andreas. Well, I, I just want to thank both of you, Andreas and Baba, just for the interesting conversation. I think these, what you present really is food for thought in terms of going forward, what can and um, should be done. So the paradox that you pre present, um, Andreas, for example, um, we're looking at the current global strategy, which is to meet the sustainable development goals, is really based on a system where you know, more and more debt has to be generated on top of already existing debt. Right. Uh, I was reading something from the Jubilee Debt Campaign, which showcases how there are several countries that were already spending more on health, uh, on, on debt repayments compared to their spending on health, for example. And what we know is the COVID pandemic has really hit hard human capital. Countries will need to reinvest um, and invest anew, afresh into human capital, education, health, and so on. You know, so given that this pandemic has really affected human capital as, as well as these debt issues and dynamics that we're talking about, then we do need to rethink the current debt architecture, the frameworks, re-engage, how do we re-engage? And I think there are also interesting conversations to be had about the current legal and environmental framework. To yeah. what extent do countries have bargaining power given the multitude of actors that are there when it comes to who, who creditors are, you know, the traditional IFIs versus the new creditors and so on and so forth. So I think that more discussion needs to be had. Baba, I'm really grateful because you showcased examples and gave experiences of the realities on the ground. And what you're saying, what I got from you is, you know, debt suspension, yes, that's something, but it's not enough. We need to do more way beyond that. And what can we do? We need new interventions. We need to be thinking of new products when it comes to restructuring debt. And I am hopeful actually that perhaps, you know, out of the current situation that we find ourselves in, we'll probably be able to develop newer, uh, new products, better products perhaps that work better than previously. And the pandemic has offered it as an opportunity to do that in an escalated manner, it maybe it would have taken years and years under normal situation, uh, under a normal situation. But I think this really forces, you know, creditors. This really forces borrowers as well to rethink uh, how to negotiate, how to bring different stakeholders together and reformulate products. Um, so the the conversation continues, and I think you guys can also offer your perspectives as you write um, your blogs, your academic productions, and so on, um, and perhaps engage with some of the Q and A questions that were raised that we're not able to um, attend to. Um, on that note, <laughs> given that it's six o'clock, I'd really just want to thank you once again for taking the time to converse with us um, in this manner. I also want to thank our audience for tuning in and also for actively engaging, posing questions that are interesting. Um, I would like to thank Sarah and her team at the IDS for all the technical support, all the preparatory support leading to the event, as well as during the event and after the event. Um, and that's it really. Thank you to our global audience. I wish you well and hope to see you in, uh, in subsequent lectures. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. I, I, I'm sorry I can't have you offer your final concluding remarks, but again, this is just to say the conversation will continue, hopefully, on another Thank you to our audience.